Right, so welcome everyone to our seminar on the eight great cuisines of Chinese cooking. Uh, so before we get started, I suppose it's important to note that there is no such thing as sort of Chinese food. Uh, China has a wide variety of different regional cuisines, so probably as many as there are stars in the sky. Uh, but today I'm really going to be focusing in on eight different regional cuisines or culinary traditions, which are considered to be the best and the most emblematic regional styles of cuisine in China. So these are sort of touted as the best regional cuisines. Um, historically, they were actually known as the four great traditions and only included Sichuan province, Shandong province, Guangdong province and Jiangsu uh, to represent the four cardinal directions. And that's something you'll notice throughout Chinese culture is the four cardinal directions play a really important role throughout um, sort of all cultural aspects. And if you came to my the seminar on the uh, five element on five element theory, a lot of things come in groups of five or four for that reason because they're linked in with Chinese five element theory. And cuisine is no different. The five elements are associated with five flavors. Uh, however, the list was eventually expanded um, over time to include four more regions, just based off of the fact that the food there tasted really good. But to be honest, you can go to pretty much anywhere in China and the food tastes amazing. Um, so don't rule out a particular location just because it's it's not one of these eight great provinces, eight great regions for food. Um, my favorite place to eat in China is not on this list. So, or at least my favorite dish in China isn't from anywhere on this list. So, uh, so don't take it as gospel. But to start off with, what are the eight great culinary traditions? Where do they come from? Well, the first one, Chuan cuisine is from Sichuan province. Then you have Yue cuisine from Guangdong province. Zhe cuisine from Zhejiang province. Uh, Xiang cuisine from Hunan province, Jiang cuisine from Jiangsu province, Min cuisine from Fujian province, Lu cuisine from Shandong province, and then Hui cuisine from Anhui province. So these are the eight great regions from, from which the eight great culinary traditions uh, are, are sort of derived from or where they come from. And uh, they some of them have names based off of the place where they're from. So Chuan cuisine, for example, comes from Sichuan province. But some of them have special names, like Guangdong province is called Yue cuisine, Fujian province Min cuisine. Uh, but I'll get into why that is in a moment. For now, let's have a look at a map and see kind of places that we're talking about. So Sichuan province, obviously very far off in the West. Uh, and on this map, you can also see what the defining features of the cuisine are. And even here, they've got sort of a spiciness graph to help out. So Sichuan, as a lot of people I'm sure know, is really defined by chilies and use of spiciness. Hunan is no different. Then down here, you've got Guangdong province, the Cantonese part of China, Fujian province here on the coast, Zhejiang province here, Anhui, Jiangsu, and Shandong. So you may also notice that a lot of these cuisines don't come from central China. They're either very far to the west, on the coast, or up in the north here, uh, because they're closer to some of the better ingredients, I suppose, whereas in the, the central north part of China, it's really more like wheat, um, not a lot grows, and you don't get a lot of really good seafood either. Uh, so to start off with, I'm going to go through each of the different cuisines and then first of all, talk about them more generally. And after that, talk about one dish that I feel is emblematic of each of one of those cuisines. Uh, and so to start off with, we're going to be talking about the cuisine from Shandong province, which is known as Lu cuisine or Lu Cai for anyone who's learning Chinese. Uh, so the reason why it's called Lu cuisine instead of Shandong cuisine is because the region was originally part of what is known as the state of Lu, which is where Confucius came from. So that's probably its most famous attribute, hence why it's kind of kept that in the name. Uh, so the history of this style dates back to the spring and autumn period over 2000 years ago. Although much of modern day Lu cuisine was developed during the Yuan dynasty, so around about from 1271 to 1368, which was the dynasty when the Mongolians took over China. Uh, due to its proximity and prestige, it was Lu cuisine that has arguably had the strongest influence over the development of Beijing style cuisine. So if you've been to Beijing before and you've eaten any sort of Beijing style food, chances are you've eaten something that's quite close to what you would get in Shandong province. Uh, so there are actually three different sub-styles of Lu cuisine. The first you have Jiaodong style from Jia, the Jiaodong Peninsula, which is of course known for its seafood dishes because of its proximity to the coast. Then you have Jinan style, which is really centered on soup. And then finally, you have a very fancy style known as Confucius's mansion cuisine, uh, which is really more based on banquets and banquet eating. Uh, Shandong cuisine is characterized by punchy flavors, thanks to its liberal use of onions, spring onions, garlic, salt, soy sauce, and vinegar. So it's really strong, pungent flavors. Uh, 
It is also known for its wide variety of cooking techniques, which are designed to bring out the natural flavor of its ingredients. In particular, you've got these two different techniques known as the bao and jia techniques that you don't really have an equivalent for in English. Uh, so bao is when you boil something on a high heat before tossing it into a wok and then quickly stir frying it without oil. And then jia is where meat is coated in flour and then stir fried. So I'm sure there are probably English equivalents for those things, but uh, I wasn't able to find them whenever I tried to translate those two terms. So what is an emblematic dish from Lu Cuisine? And this might come as quite a shock uh, in terms of its appearance, but it's known as sweet and sour yellow river carp in English, or in Chinese it's tang zu li yu. So tang means sugar, zu means vinegar, and then li yu is river carp. So altogether in Chinese, it means sugar, vinegar, river carp, but in English, we tend to say sweet and sour river carp. Uh, so this is one of the most iconic dishes in Shandong and was even served at imperial banquets for several hundreds of years. It is perhaps most well known for its unusual presentation, which is designed to give the illusion that the fish has actually been caught while it's jumping out of water. So this is why you have the tail curved up and the head curved up to make it look as though it is jumping. So how do they achieve that? Well, first of all, incisions are made in the skin, and then the fish is breaded and seasoned with salt, pepper, and soy sauce. After that, it's shaped and deep fried. So it's kind of deep fried in the shape, which should hold it in that shape. The sweet and sour sauce is made from a mixture of sugar, vinegar, ginger, spring onions, Shaoxing rice wine, and soy sauce, and is actually poured over the top of the fish after it's been cooked. So you don't, you don't cook the fish in the sauce. You fry it first in the shape, and then you pour the sauce on afterwards. So next we have arguably the most famous of the eight cuisines, probably one that you've heard of before, and that is Chuan cuisine, or in Chinese known as Chuan Cai, which comes from Sichuan province. It's not only the most well-known internationally, it is the most well-known and widely disseminated of the eight great cuisines in China. So wherever you go in China, you're going to come across a Sichuan restaurant, and you're probably going to enter restaurants that serve Sichuanese style food. Um, it has also become infamous for its spiciness, but this is a relatively new inclusion. So before chilies were introduced into China, the region was initially known for the sweetness of its cuisine. So around about during the Three Kingdoms period from 220 to 280. And then eventually it became really well known for its pungent flavors during the Jin Dynasty, so around about 265 AD to 420. It wasn't until the 16th century when Portuguese sailors introduced chilies from South America to China via Macau that they became a staple part of the cuisine. In fact, an old local saying indicates that the style is locally celebrated for the diversity of its flavours, not for the spiciness of its flavours. And this old saying is one dish, one flavour, 100 dishes, 100 flavours. So before the advent of chilies coming into the country through these Portuguese sailors, Sichuan province was actually really known for its diversity rather than for its spiciness. Uh, that being said, it is now characterised by its spiciness, which comes from the chilli specifically, but also for its numbing flavour, which comes from a native ingredient known as the Sichuan peppercorn, which actually does numb your tongue. Uh, so hot chilies are also believed within traditional Chinese medicine to open your pores and to drive out internal dampness, which is why it's considered so good for the Sichuan climate. So it's not just because Sichuanese people really liked chilies and the flavor of them. It was because they really believed that this sort of the, the chilies had a particular property within traditional Chinese medicine that helped them alleviate this kind of internal dampness that would cause different types of uh, um, infections and diseases. Uh, so that's why they ate them as well. They thought it was a good sort of had medicinal properties. So now moving on to the most emblematic dish. And this one is sort of without question, I think I've heard from Sichuanese people, this is the dish they would pick to describe, even though it's not maybe the most famous internationally, it's a dish that you will find in every Sichuanese restaurant. It's known in English rather bizarrely as fish fragrant eggplant, and in Chinese as yu xiang qie zi. So yu means fish, xiang means fragrance, qie zi means eggplant. So it literally means fish fragrant eggplant in Chinese. Uh, so Chuan cuisine has a plethora of recognizable dishes, including things like Maopo tofu and Kung Pao chicken, but this one is seen to be the most iconic within Sichuan province itself. 
Uh, so the sauce is actually made by frying the ingredients in oil until they become fragrant. Then water, starch, sugar, and vinegar are added. So you take all of these different ingredients, garlic, spring onions, ginger, salt, uh, this thing called doubanjiang, or broad bean chili paste, which is a really popular ingredient in China. You can get it from any Chinese supermarket. Also pickled red chilies and soy sauce. You fry that up and then you put starch, sugar, and uh, vinegar into it to kind of thicken it up. Uh, then the sauce is actually, again, ladled on top of braised eggplant. So you don't actually cook the eggplant in the sauce. You braise the eggplant first, or sometimes I fry it, and then you ladle this sauce on top. Uh, it's also important to note, why is it called fish fragrant eggplant? Does it have fish in it? I'm a vegetarian. It doesn't have fish, so don't worry if you are. Uh, the term yusheng is actually referred to the type of sauce it's cooked in. So this is a sauce that was traditionally used to cook fish, and hence why when you smell it, it smells like it's going to be a fish dish, but it doesn't actually contain any fish or any seafood of any kind. So it's totally safe for vegetarians. Uh, a lot of Sichuanese cuisine is actually, that even mapo tofu, you can make with mints, but you can make it without mints as well. So it's a good dish if you have vegetarian friends or if you are a vegetarian. Uh, so then moving on to our next cuisine, which is su cuisine in Chinese known as su cai. So su cuisine is one of the most venerated styles in the country and was the second most popular among imperials. I've just realized I've kind of said most venerated. I've got this very strange looking fish here. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, it is still served at state banquets to this day. So it really sort of important political events. This style places just as much emphasis on presentation as it does on flavour, as evidenced by this dish here, which is known as squirrel-shaped mandarin fish, uh, because it's meant to look like a squirrel. Uh, the style aims to draw out the natural flavour of its ingredients using cooking techniques. So seasons and seasoning and spice it, spices are used very, very sparingly. The idea is to get as fresh a flavour as possible. Uh, the signature dish are meant to be aromatic, slightly salty, and a bit sweet, but not oily or greasy, unlike sort of Sichuan style food and Hunan style food. Uh, the ingredients are often seasonal and are chosen as much for their medicinal properties as they are for their flavour. So there are actually four different substyles of Su cuisine. You've got the Jinling style, which is really well known for its duck dishes and its fine cutting techniques. Then you have Su Xi, which is sweeter than the other styles and emphasises seasonal vegetables. After that, you have xu hai, which aims to perfectly balance sweetness, sourness, bitterness, heat, and saltiness, which are considered to be the five core flavors, which are then linked up to the five elements. And then the final one is huai yang style, which is praised as the finest of the four. So huai yang style is the one that tends to be served at state banquets. So then I know these may not look terribly impressive. I was about to say it's all about presentation, but the food does taste very good. Uh, but the emblematic dish I've chosen for su cuisine is known as lion's head in English, or shi zi tou. In Chinese, shi zi means lion, tou means head. So again, it's an exact translation. Uh, so the idea is, again, it's meant to look like a lion's head that's surrounded by a mane of vegetables, which you have here, and you also have kind of here, I guess. Uh, so the meatballs are around about the size of your hand. These aren't kind of normal sized meatballs. They're sort of fist sized. And they're made, made using minced pork, chopped water chestnut, spring onions, ginger, and eggs. Uh, but then you've got two different types of lion's head. So you have up here, red lion's head, which is stewed in soy sauce with either Chinese cabbage or bamboo shoot and tofu. So it gives it a sort of red sheen to it. And then you have white lion's head, which is stewed or steamed with Chinese cabbage and served with a clear soup that you can see down here. And it retains this kind of white color coloring. So it is literally just named after the two different colors that they are. And uh, they are different in terms of flavor as well. So then after that, moving on to another, what I would say is probably if not the most famous, the second most famous after Sichuan, this and Sichuanese cuisine tend to sort of fight for the top spot is Yue cuisine. So chances are, if you've eaten Chinese food in the UK, you've had Sichuanese food and you've also had Yue cuisine, also known as Cantonese cuisine or in Chinese, Yue Cai. It is the most internationally well-known and widely available style of Chinese food. So most Chinese restaurants and takeaways in the UK serve an adapted version of Yue cuisine. Uh, the style is characterized by a preference for fresh ingredients, minimal use of seasoning, and quick methods of cooking, particularly things like steaming or stir frying or flash frying. Due to Guangdong and Hong Kong being located on the coast, there's also a marked preference for seafood, as you can imagine. Uh, 
Uh, so this style of cuisine has become notorious in recent years due to its controversial ingredients, things like shark's fin, snake and rat. So alongside being the cuisine that's the most widely available around the world, it's also the one that has the most unusual ingredients when you eat it within China in its own country. Uh, there is, in fact, if you've ever heard this old uh, idiom, it's, it actually comes from U.S. cuisine, it comes from uh, Cantonese, that states they will eat anything with four legs except a table and anything with wings except an airplane. So alongside being, I guess, the most visible of all the cuisines and the most familiar, it's also probably one of the strangest in when you eat it in China. Uh, so the signature dish that I've chosen isn't really a dish at all, but it's actually a style of eating known as yum cha or yin cha in uh, Mandarin Chinese. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a specific dish here, and instead I'm going to focus on this kind of custom, which I feel is way more sort of indicative of, I get well, more familiar to a lot of people as well. Uh, a lot of you will know it as dim sum, but the actual custom is known as yum cha. Uh, so dim sum in Chinese is known as guang shi dian xin. Guang shi means Guangdong style. Dian xin means to touch heart which is really lovely um so the actual name of the small dishes that you eat during yum cha is called di are called dim sum but the act itself of eating these small dishes and drinking tea is called yum cha so yum cha describes as i said the custom of drinking tea while eating small dishes known as dim sum and the custom actually has its roots in the silk road it all started when travelers would stop at tea houses to rest and then they would ask for these small dishes of food just to give them an energy boost so they'd already eaten before or they couldn't afford to eat too much they just wanted something small to get them on their way to the next place it is now a popular tradition in guangdong hong kong and macau so several types of tea are served during yum cha including chrysanthemum tea green tea oolong tea and puar depending on what you're eating and depending on what your preferences are the dim sum itself is designed to be bite-sized and is typically steamed or stir-fried rather than deep-fried to preserve the natural flavour. They can be savoury dishes, such as dumplings like the ones you see here, or things like phoenix claws, which is the euphemistic name for uh, chicken's feet, or they can be sweet as well, such as egg tarts and tofu pudding. Now, traditional eateries still continue to use what's known as the cart method, where the dishes are cooked and then put on heated carts. They are normally priced by their size, and you just take them off the cart as the woman or man, could be a man, goes around the restaurant with the cart, you pull them off, and then she makes a note on your uh, receipt of which sort of dishes you've taken. Now, at the very end, you take up your receipt and you pay for everything that you've eaten. So it's a really, really nice, relaxed way. And you can sort of sit there for hours, sort of like tapas, and pick off these different dishes and then pay at the very end. So it's a very sort of relaxing kind of afternoon type activity. Uh, and with all that out of the way, and sorry if you're already hungry, but you can now go get a snack. Uh, we're going to take a five minute break. So you can either daydream about food or you can go get some food if you want. Uh, so it's just before 7.30 now. So if we could meet back at um, 7.33, that'll be perfect. And now Perfect. And then we'll move on to our next location, which is Fujian province uh, and what is known as Min cuisine or in Chinese known as Min Tai. Uh, so you may notice that, of course, this is another one of the cuisines that's not named after the province where it originates from. Uh, so the term Min derives from the term Minnan, which is an old name for this particular region of southern Fujian province. So it's sort of a culturally defined area. Uh, so the style itself is characterized by its emphasis on umami flavors, but is also known for having light and flavorful dishes. So it's sort of like very meaty kind of flavors, but also some lighter flavors. It is one of the hardest cuisines to recreate, since it relies heavily on rare native ingredients, such as woodland mushrooms and local species of fish. So this is one that you won't really find outside of China, and one that is very, very difficult to recreate outside of China. Uh, the main cooking methods used are steaming, stewing, boiling and braising to try and enhance the natural flavours of these kind of wild ingredients. There is also a strong emphasis on the careful preparation of elaborate broths and soups, with an old local saying even going so far as to simply state a meal would simply be incomplete without soup. So the local saying is it is unacceptable for a meal to not have soup. Uh, so really, really well known for all these different really delicious types of soup. Uh, so there are three different substyles sub of Min cuisine. You have Fuzhou style, which is named after the capital of uh, Fujian province and is lighter in flavour than the other styles with sweet and sour flavours and lots and lots of soup dishes. 
Then you have Southern Fujian style, which uses more sugar and spices. So it's got a bit more sort of heavy, punchy flavor to it and has a lot of slow cooked soup dishes and includes dipping sauces with most of the dishes as well. And then after that, you have Western Fujian style cuisine, which has a slightly spicier taste due to the use of mustard and pepper and is saltier and oilier than the others, utilizing steaming, frying and stir frying techniques and focusing on meat rather than seafood because Western Fujian is much further inland. Uh, and the uh, signature dish, as you may have guessed, that I've chosen for this cuisine is a soup. And it has probably my favorite Chinese name of any dish ever, which is uh, Buddha Jumps Over the Wall, which some people may have uh, heard of before. If you're probably well known for having a very strange name uh, in Chinese, it's known as Fu Tiao Qiang. Fu means Buddha, Tiao means jump, Qiang means wall. So it literally means Buddha jumps over the wall. Uh, so the dish itself is known or notorious throughout China for its complexity and the controversy surrounding some of its ingredients. So things like uh, shark's fin, abalone, sea cucumber, either rare ingredients or uh, damaging ingredients to the environment. Uh, so why is it called Buddha jumps over the wall? Well, according to legend, a Qing scholar was traveling by foot to visit his friends and was carrying all of his food in a clay jar. So these are the types of jars that you would normally use to carry rice wine. Uh, but he was carrying a bunch of sort of fancy ingredients in this jar. He actually stopped near to a Buddhist monastery and started to heat up the ingredients with some water over an open fire. Although they were forbidden from eating meat, um, one Buddhist monk was so attracted by the aroma of this particular soup that he jumped over the wall to see where it was coming from. Uh, it is believed, in fact, that this soup is so delicious that it could even tempt the Buddha himself to eat meat. So hence why it's called Buddha jumps over the wall. Uh, in Kai Meifai in London, one bowl of this soup was sold for £108 in 2005, earning it the Guinness World Record of most expensive soup in the world. Uh, it is also just generally speaking in China, considered to be one of the most expensive dishes. It requires over 30 ingredients to cook and takes between one to three days to cook. So most restaurants that serve it will specialise in this dish alone. Uh, and it includes many very expensive gifts, uh, not gifts, ingredients, uh, such as Quail's eggs, sea cucumbers, abalone, and uh, abalone, pronouncing that wrong, and scallops as well. So lots of really rare, really expensive ingredients. Even um, the sparrow's nest, that thing that's made from sparrow spit, is sometimes put into this particular soup. But the ingredients that are used depend on the restaurant and are usually like a closely guarded secret. But it's extremely expensive, even when you buy it in China. Uh, so then moving on again to probably my favorite, certainly the cuisine that's closest to my heart. So I lived in Hunan province for two years uh, and the cuisine from Hunan province is known as Xiang cuisine or Xiang Cai, which is named after the Xiang River in Hunan province. Uh, but you may also know Hunan province as the home province of Mao Zedong or Chairman Mao. Uh, so the dish in this photo is even named Chairman Mao's red braised pork because of his love for the dish. He supposedly ate it nearly every day and believes that it enhanced your sort of thinking power, which I think is great just to eat like fatty pork all day and think that it's sort of making you more intelligent. Uh, Xiang cuisine is often compared to Chuan cuisine from Sichuan province due to their shared characteristic of spiciness, but Xiang cuisine is rumored to be even spicier since the sour flavors that are used in Hunan cuisine actually activate the taste buds rather than the numbing flavors in Sichuan cuisine, which close down your taste buds. So the idea with Hunan cuisine is you're opening up your taste buds to spiciness, whereas in Sichuan cuisine, you numb the taste buds so you can eat more spicy food without it hurting you. Uh, personally, I've tried both, and I think, to be controversial here, I think Sichuanese cuisine is definitely spicier. I definitely had a lot more pain eating, but I suppose I got used to Hunanese cuisine over time. Uh, but I do think Sichuanese cuisine is definitely spicier. Uh, so similar to Chuan cuisine, however, is the belief that the use of chilies will drive out the excess dampness that is caused by the Hunani, Hunan's humid climate. Uh, so alongside its spicy and sour flavors, Xiang cuisine is arguably the most oily of all the eight cuisines. I can definitely attest to this. They use a lot of oil, but it is delicious. And the sour flavors are really amazing as well. Uh, they're also really well known for this liberal, liberal use of their own sort of signature ingredient. It's used in Guizhou province a lot as well, called chopped chilies, which are chilies that have been pickled in vinegar and salt. And again, they taste delicious. You can buy jars of them when you're there. It's so good. You can watch them being made as well, watch them getting chopped up. It's great. Uh, so the signature dish that I've picked for Hunan style cuisine, it's sort of a lesser well-known dish 
called Dongan chicken, and it's quite easy to make if you want to make it at home. In Chinese, it's known as Dongan Ziji, and it's named after the place where it's from. So Dongan is a county within uh, Hunan province. So Dongan chicken is supposedly based on a dish known as vinegar chicken, which dates all the way back to the Tang Dynasty from 618 to 907. Uh, but it has another origin story as well. So some say it was actually invented by three old ladies who ran a small village restaurant. Late one evening, a group of merchants showed up at the restaurant demanding to be served. Almost all of the ingredients in the pantry had been used, so the women had to improvise. They quickly slaughtered two of the chickens they had and made a new dish using all of the leftover ingredients. The result was so delicious that the merchants actually spread word of it on their travels and eventually it became a staple part of Hunani's cuisine. Uh, so in terms of how it's made, and as I said, it is relatively easy to make. Uh, the chicken is first parboiled. You take a, pretty much a whole chicken, parboil it with a mixture of ginger and green onion. Then once the chicken is cooled, it's stirred. So you pull off, you then cut it into pieces, stir fry it with peanut oil, fresh chilies, dried chilies, Shaoxing rice wine, vinegar and salt. Um, sometimes chicken broth is added to keep the meat tender. So you can see just a little bit of broth here. So you can use the broth from when you parboil the chicken and add it in. And it does taste this is pre-vegetarian days it's so good it's probably second my second favorite dish in china but it tastes way better than i'm making it sound in terms of like the base ingredients it's just got a really like fresh kind of sour spicy flavor to it so i'd urge everyone to have a try at making it if you do eat meat obviously uh, and then next on our list, uh, we'll be talking about hui cuisine, which is probably one of the most obscure, known in Chinese as hui cai. It's the least well known of the eight dishes, particularly even throughout China, and it is the hardest to replicate. So alongside min cuisine, it is incredibly hard to replicate hui cuisine as it relies really heavily on wild local ingredients, such as wild mountain herbs and native animal species. It's very seasonal as well. It is also known for its preference for ham and tofu in its signature dishes. Uh, it tends to utilize simple cooking techniques such as braising and stewing. Uh, due to its use of wild and seasonal ingredients, it is the style that is most heavily influenced by traditional Chinese medicine and places great emphasis on the uh, health properties and medicinal properties of its signature ingredients. So most of its ingredients are wild caught animals such as frogs and turtles and also things like herbs, mushrooms, things that you get from the mountains in this particular region. Also one of the most beautiful regions in China. So I'd urge people also to travel in Anhui province. Uh, but what is my favorite food from Anhui province? it's tiger's fur tofu and it's probably one of the dishes that no matter when you travel in Anhui province you'll be able to find it it's a very popular traditional snack in Chinese it's known as hu pi mao dofu so hu means tiger pi mao means fur dofu means tofu so it does literally translate again to mean tiger's fur tofu uh, so it's actually really hard to pin down signature dishes in Hui cuisine due to the fact that it's really kind of a foraging and seasonal based cuisine. Uh, but this tofu is really this type of tofu is a really popular street snack and you'll find it pretty much throughout the year. So it's one of the only things that you'll find regularly that I could recommend people try if you are traveling in the area. Uh, so in terms of how it's made, it's sort of like stinky tofu. It's made from fermented tofu, which is then deep fried in sesame oil or grilled. And then it's typically served with a sauce made from hot chilies, which you can see here. Uh, so why is it named tiger's fur tofu? Well, it's because of the white mold that actually grows on the fermented tofu, which is said to look like fluffy white fur. So I'm sure that's making you all incredibly hungry for this dish now and not putting you off at all. Uh, and then last but not least on our sort of culinary journey through China, we'll be talking about zhe cuisine, known as zhe cai in Chinese, which is known for its mild flavors, as the aim is to unlock the natural flavor of the key ingredients using various cooking techniques, such as quick frying, stir frying, deep frying, simmering, steaming, and brine soaking. It also has a lot of similarities to traditional Japanese cuisine, and there's a lot of crossover there between Japanese cuisine and uh, zhe cuisine due to the proximity on the coast. Uh, the three sub-styles are known as Hangzhou style, which has the most prestige, and it's known for its use of bamboo shoots in over half of its signature dishes. Then you have Shaoxing style, which is known for its poultry and freshwater fish specialties, as well as the 2,000-year-old cooking wine, which is really a staple. If you want to get, if you want to cook Chinese food, you have to buy Shaoxing rice wine. Uh, and again, you can get it from pretty much any Chinese supermarket. And then finally, the last uh, 
substyle is known as Ningbo style, which is saltier than the others and famed for its seafood dishes and also its desserts. Uh, so what signature dish have I chosen for Jil Cuisine, our final one on the list? Well, it's Longjing shrimp, which again is relatively easy to make if you want to make it at home. It's known in Chinese as Longjing, Xia Ren. So Long means dragon, Jing means well, Xia Ren means shrimp. So it literally means dragon's well shrimp. And I'll explain why, but you can already see why, because it's made with dragon's well tea uh, in a moment. But for now, I want to talk about the legend behind this particular dish. So again, this is a legend that you hear kind of rehashed in various different ways for various different things. There's always an emperor and the emperor always wants to be among the common people in a lot of these stories. And uh, this backstory is no different. So supposedly the Qianlong emperor of the uh, Qing dynasty wanted to experience what life was like as one of the common people. So he decided to tour the company, uh, country sorry, in disguise. Uh, when he got to Hangzhou, he took refuge in the home of a local woman when it started to rain, and she brewed him some tea. He was so impressed by the tea that he actually asked her for some of the tea leaves and took them with him up one of his sleeves. And this was Dragon's Well Tea, which the region is really well known for, and it does taste amazing. Uh, at sunset, he arrived at an inn and ordered a plate of fried shrimp. He asked the waiter to brew him some of the tea uh, for him, but as he reached into his... Um, into his sleeve to fetch it, the waiter actually caught sight of his imperial robes underneath his kind of common clothing and realized that he was the emperor and started panicking. So the waiter took the, uh, the, the tea back to the chef, explained to the chef that he was about to cook some fried shrimp for the emperor of China. And of course, then the chef started to panic. And as he made the fried shrimp, instead of grabbing some spring onions, he accidentally grabbed some of the tea leaves and put them in with the shrimp. But when they served this particular dish to the emperor, he thought it was so delicious that he demanded for, the, for him to give them the recipe, for the chef to give the recipe. And then it was used from then on in imperial banquet dishes. So it, became, it went from being a sort of happy accident to one of the most famous dishes in China. Uh, so the shrimp is first marinated in a mixture of salt, egg white, starch, water and Shaoxing rice wine before being flash fried. The tea leaves are removed from the brewed tea, so you brew tea while you're making flash frying the shrimp, and then you add the brewed tea leaves to the shrimp. Then finally, a very small amount of the liquid tea is added and allowed to boil off as the shrimp are flash frying. Uh, so it's regarded so highly within Chinese cuisine, this is another one of the dishes that makes it into political banquets, that it was even served to President Nixon at a government banquet in 1972. So it carries a great deal of political prestige within the country from being a favourite of the emperor right through to being given to uh, President Nixon during his trip, his first trip to China. Uh, and with all that out of the way, thank you very much for joining us for the seminar today. And now you can stop the recording if you want. Uh, we'll move on to our final discussion.